is that physical activity and physical fitness are not the exact same thing, okay? Many of you talked about in your initial definition that I'm looking at people and if they look a certain way, that will tell me that they work out. Now, the assumption of all of that probably is if I work out, does that mean I'm physically active? I got a no, I got a kind of halfway yes in the back, okay? In the back, your name is Sarah. You were kind of maybe, so you think, can I work out and not be physically active? Yes. Okay. Could I work out, but maybe not get enough physical activity? Okay. Especially if it's resistance training only. Okay. Especially if it's only resistance training. A lot of our bros, our gender neutral bros, okay, there may be a lot of bros that lift weights but are actually are not very active otherwise. Okay. And there's some benefit to the strength and those things on health, but not all. So this graph shows you, okay, the overall percentile sort of from the least fit or the least active up to the most fit and the most active. And it shows you then, this is your relative risk. This is all cause mortality. This is the risk of dying from anything. And what I want you to know is that, look, Here's the graph for physical activity. The most active people are at less risk than the people that are the least active. But if we measure physical fitness, and we'll talk about how we define fitness in this instance, okay? If you are more fit, okay, you may be active, but not very fit. If you can be very, very fit, which is gonna involve certain specific kinds of exercise, you're gonna get a much larger reduction. Okay, in our risk of dying. So in this way, activity and fitness are related, but they are not exactly the same thing. We'll kind of get into the how and why of that as we move. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. What I will tell you at this point is it's very difficult to be physically fit and not be physically active. Okay. But you may be physically active but not be very fit, okay? You all may know people. You guys, in comparison to the kind of all Americans at large are a very active group. You walk to and from classes, okay? You get a lot of activity. But maybe it's just walking. You may not actually be very, very fit in that way, okay? So we gotta, we gotta kind of work our way through all of these. The other piece of this, that goes along with activity and fitness that we need to pay attention to is the idea of being overweight or being obese, okay? Again, this is a related concept, and we'll talk a whole bunch about kind of what it means to be obese, why being obese is so bad later on in class. But what I want you guys to look at with this is, in the 1960s, about 10% of the U.S. population was obese. Okay, about 10%, right? We are projected by 2030 to be at about half of the country will be obese, okay? If we were to do this based upon something called the body mass index, there's a really good chance that almost no one in this room, almost no one that is y'all's age is obese by BMI. And yet, if half of the country is this, half of all adults are this, throw out all of the people that are under 25, and you're going to get like three quarters of the people that are my age are obese. Okay? And so it's this dramatically increasing problem. So what you can see then is, look, boom, 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 boom. Ooh, it's the 80s. It begins to shoot up, and it's been climbing steadily. So my question for you guys is this. Why? Why has this gone up? Anybody want to guess? Sedentary lifestyles, office jobs. Sedentary lifestyles, office jobs. Maybe not in 1960, but let's, let's harken back to like 1900, okay? What do you guys think was the single most common job 
in 1900. Slaughterhouse, okay, it's a little grim, but maybe, sure. Farming, okay. Or maybe you were a factory worker with the worst working conditions in the entire world. No air conditioning, there was no OSHA, whatever. You're in the slaughterhouse, it's not good, okay. Anybody ever worked on a farm? My maternal grandparents were dairy farmers in Kansas. Okay, anybody works on a farm? Anybody have parents or grandparents that worked on a farm? Okay. How active is farming? Very active. Okay. Very, very active. Good. So that's part of it. You're not very active when you sit your ass behind a computer all day. I can assure you of that. Okay. I just sit there. Even if I had like a standing desk, you're still not very active. Even if you have one of those walking treadmill desks. You guys seen those? I don't know how people do that. Like I would get distracted. Like I'd forget what I was doing and like fly off the back of the treadmill. It wouldn't work for me. Okay. So our work, quote unquote, okay, is going to be there. How do you think people got from place to place in 1900? Okay, horse, yeah, that's probably. What if you couldn't afford a horse? You walked, you rode a bike, right? How do we get around now? Car? If I need something, I'm just gonna hit up the Uber, right? Or I'm gonna get one of those little death scooters that you guys, I see you all riding, right? You weave into that on the sidewalks where you're not supposed to be, not wearing helmets and all of that, okay? Yes, I have become my mother in that particular way. Right? That's part of this. We've become more sedentary. You guys, will, I'll show you all some numbers and all of that, okay? At least half, maybe about half of the country doesn't meet the select food guidelines anymore. What else is happening? Fast food. Is fast food bad for us? It says relative, I'm sorry. If I eat it all the time, okay, why is fast food bad? Trans fat. What is trans fat? There's a lot of cholesterol. Okay, cholesterol is bad. It's okay. Cholesterol bad, maybe. Okay. Do we not eat fatty things in 1900? They ate steak, they ate hamburger, they ate eggs, they ate cheese, they had to drink whole milk, right? You see cholesterol in those things. Process. What does that mean? Okay. What what non-natural? This is I, I'm y'all will find this. So I'm I'm being a jackass on purpose here. I, I, I'm just I want you all to when we say food is processed, what does that actually mean? So you see, there's a lot of non-natural things that are, this drives my wife crazy because she like our like our daughter like doesn't like chocolate like she's never had like anything. My wife was like, oh well, there was this and she's never had like apple juice or anything because my wife who has no background in nutrition or anything, you know, like we don't want all this all this natural stuff, whatever. And so my question is, I always ask her, she said, what does it mean? What does processed food mean? What do we do to food when we process it? We put salt in. Why do you put salt in it? It tastes better, yes. What do you also put salt in it for? It's a preservative. Okay, good. Is salt bad for us? In high amounts, it will raise your blood pressure. Sure. Okay. So there might be something we've added. When we process food, we add things to it, right? They may not be synthetic, unnatural things, but they may be things that don't normally exist in that food. Okay. The problem with fast food for a lot of people is it tastes really good, right? And so when a food tastes good, what do you want to do? Eat more. Also, many of the ways that it is cooked and processed, okay, there may be added sugar, okay? Added sugar in and of itself is not bad. Sugar is not evil. Added sugar is just regular sugar, okay? The problem is is that more sugar equals more calories. The problem is some of our preservatives add more calories. The problem is when you fry foods, it adds more calories, okay? 
it also makes it taste delightful. That's the problem. For anyone who's been to OU Texas, the Texas State Fair, you can get fried everything, right? Okay, so the problem that happens with fast food, or in some ways, lots of non-fast food that we make at home that looks like fast food, okay, is that we have easier access to food. The way we prepare the food makes it more calorically dense and the way that we prepare it also tends to make it taste better. And so we want to eat more of it, right? And it's the overconsumption of food beyond what we normally need that is going to lead to overweight and obesity. I promise you guys, I could feed you all, every one of you in here, three Twinkies a day and only three Twinkies and I'll make every one of you lose weight, okay? There's nothing natural in a Twinkie. They still taste great. They will survive nuclear winter, okay, or the zombie apocalypse or whatever you want. But I know a Twinkie's like 250 or 300 calories. For most of you, if I gave you 900 calories in a day and only that and some water, you're going to lose weight. You're eating like trash, okay, but you're still going to lose weight. If I overfeed you salmon and like salad and those kinds of things, and you get more calories than you need in a day, you're going to gain weight even though you're eating lean and clean and perfect and whatever all of this stuff is, okay? It's significantly more complicated than that, but that's the general sense, okay? We have ready access to calorically dense food to a much greater extent now, okay? Also, the less calorically dense food is now more expensive, okay? We don't have one here. We have one in the city. Anybody ever, anybody ever go shop at Whole Foods rather than just going to Walmart? That shit is expensive, right? Buying organic vegetables, buying fruit and vegetables, buying lean meat like salmon and steak and these kinds of things, it's expensive, okay? And, you know, we have people, you know, like a, a fifth of the country has food insecurities because of poverty and these things. And so sometimes the cheaper the food is, the more calorically dense it is, which in some ways is good, but it can also lead to overeating. So I'm less active, I'm eating more, voila, guess what? I'm now overweight and I'm now obese. And that causes problems for my health. Okay? Does that make sense? Anybody else really hungry right now? Right? I mean, it's like right around lunch. I'm like, ooh, I need some Chick-fil-A. Okay. I forgot my I forgot my lunch today, so I gotta figure out a way. Is there a way for me to go someplace and get some non-calorically dense kind of food? Okay. So here is um, the other thing that we we realize now. Okay. If you take like one of three things away from class, I want you to take this away. Not all obesity is the same, okay? And I tell you guys this because these statistics tell us, not to alarm you, but I, I am one of these statistics. I resemble this remark. Over the next 20 years, these statistics tell us that on average, every one of you is going to gain 10 pounds, okay? I'm going to raise my hand. I'm like, yep, right here. Okay, I'm there. For a host of reasons, I know what I should be doing and I still can't do it. I am a statistic, okay? The average American gains 20 pounds between the ages of 25 and 45. Okay? That will take some people from normal weight to overweight. That will take some people that are overweight now into obese. It will take some people that are obese now into morbidly obese, okay? We're going to set that aside for a second. It's not a great thing, but not all overweight and not all obesity are the same. We have what we call metabolically healthy obesity and metabolically unhealthy. Okay, This just simply shows the number of research articles that have been published by year where they're trying to split out people that are metabolically healthy but obese and metabolically unhealthy. Okay. 
if you are physically active and if you are physically fit, both of which you can do regardless of what your sort of weight and body size are, you can do both of those things. You have half the likelihood of dying prematurely as a person that is normal weight, let's say. Being physically active, being physically fit trumps obesity. It trumps it dramatically. That should hearten all of us because we can all take our ass out and walk today. Okay? We may not all be able to go to CrossFit or want to go to CrossFit today. We can all go walk. We can all go walk our dog, right? Or go walk around with a friend. We can all get the amount of activity that we need every day. So if you can be active, we can counteract a lot of the deleterious effects of overweight and obesity. Okay? We can be what we would call metabolically healthy and obese rather than metabolically unhealthy. Later in the semester, we'll talk about something called type 2 diabetes. If you are relatively physically fit and relatively physically active, one, you'll probably never become a type 2 diabetic. And if you do by chance become a type 2 diabetic, we can almost entirely treat it just by having to be more physically active. A little bit of diet tweak, okay, and physical activity, and we can fix it. All right. So that's kind of my pitch. Right. Okay, here's this thing, lean, right? Aerobically fit, aerobically unfit. Here's our obese people that are aerobically fit and aerobically unfit, and you will look that I can be obese and fit, I'm actually better off than a person that is lean. And okay. All right. So let's talk then about the difference between physical activity and exercise, and then we'll get into kind of how we how we define all of this. Physical activity is any bodily movement produced by muscles that results in any amount of energy expenditure above the baseline levels. Okay. Any amount. So we'll do we'll do an example. So name in the green shirt here. Your name is Maddie. Maddie. Maddie, do something that is a bodily movement produced by a muscle. Perfect. Okay. Now, was that physical activity? Yes. Okay. Did it take her energy above just sitting there to do this? Not very much, but a little bit, right? So that's, in some ways, that's physical activity. We could ask Maddie to get up and do some squats for us, Maddie, you don't have to, okay? To get up and do some squats, that's physical activity. Walk around the room, that's physical activity, okay? Any bodily movement produced by muscles, you can't move without using muscles, that's just a, an aside, okay? That results in a substantial increase over resting energy expenditure. We define physical activity by its energy expenditure. We will define exercise and kind of how we prescribe training for people based upon energy expenditure above rest. Okay? So think about it this way. Walking is a substantial increase in energy use over sitting. Running is a further substantial increase in energy over walking. Running fast is substantial increase over both of these things. So this using of energy is one of the most important things that we do. The muscles generate force, they help us move, that requires energy. It's that energy use that alters the cardiovascular system response, it alters the pulmonary system. And it's that energy use and those system responses that cause them to adapt to make us healthy. Exercise is a particular form of physical activity. Okay? It's planned, structured, theoretically repetitive, and it is done to increase or maintain physical fitness. Okay? You walking back over to your next class is physical activity. It is likely not going to be exercise unless you're going to sprint to your next class with the stated goal of I'm doing this to become more fit. Okay. 
Does that make sense? Okay. People that exercise a lot may be very physically active, but you may also be very active, but never exercise. Also, the type of physical activity that will count as exercise, the type of physical activity that's required to make you more fit is going to vary based upon what your current level of fitness is. Okay? You take a person that never does anything, okay? and walking may be enough for them. If you've been in a hospital bed for 90 straight days, walking may be enough activity, a high enough intensity to count as exercise and make you more fit. For most of you, walking is not going to be sufficient. For some of you, jogging is not going to be sufficient. You've got to You've got to run sort of briskly, a brisk job, rather than a slow, easy job. Okay? For some of you, lifting a light weight is not going to be enough. It's going to be activity, but it's not enough to make you strong. So that's going to vary. But we'll talk a whole bunch about how we arrive at what we need to do with that when we get a little farther on the class. Okay? Questions? All right, this is a good place we'll stop. You guys can take a text slash Instagram break if you would like, and, uh, and then we will resume here in just a couple of minutes. I don't know how much of this you guys covered in, you guys covered either in chemistry. You've all had like one class in chemistry, right? Something you guys talked about together. Remember, I'm sure that was years and years ago for some of you, a couple of years at least. But you guys talk about energy and ATP in chemistry class. You guys talk about it, I mean, not in the anatomy, but in physiology class. Okay. So, very, very brief overview here. Energy is a measure of our ability to perform work, okay? We're not going to talk about the laws of thermodynamics and that energy can either be created nor destroyed. It just gets shifted around from one place to the other, but we measure energy in kcals, which are what you guys think of as calories, okay? Food contains energy, right? Food contains energy. When I contract a muscle, when I digest food, Okay, just sitting there regulating your body temperature when your heart contracts, which it's doing a bunch, that requires energy. Okay, and so things to keep in mind when we look at energy as it relates to physical activity and exercise. Okay, ATP is energy, that's kind of our unit of measure. And we can increase energy used during activities by either upping the intensity of that exercise. Okay or by increasing the duration. We can increase intensity mostly by making it harder, right? I can increase the intensity of walking by walking on a treadmill. I'm in my treadmill here, okay? Treadmill is flat. I'm walking at two miles an hour. That's a certain amount. I can make it more difficult if I put the incline up to 2%, more difficult if I put up to 4%, or if I go faster. We can do these kinds of things, all right? That's the idea behind <coughs> I don't really talk about kind of ATP stuff. That's pretty much there. Your daily energy expenditure, and this is going to come circle back around into this idea of obesity and kind of how we might shift around and change body composition. Okay. Everybody uses a certain amount of energy every day. If we think of that as a pie, okay. Somewhere between maybe 50% to 60 or 65% of the energy you expend every day is what we would call basal or resting metabolic rate. This is energy expenditure that your body uses just to keep you alive and to keep your normal physiological processes going. Right? 
that's basal or resting metabolic rate. Okay. So about five to ten percent of your daily energy expenditure comes from what we call the thermic effect of eating or the thermic effect of food. You eat, you have to digest that food, that requires energy. And that's going to be shifted around based upon how much it is that you're actually eating. Okay. The other piece of this pie, this quarter or third, depending upon how active you are, is going to come from physical activity. Now, in some people, if you're very, very active, then this may take up to half or even, even more of your overall energy expenditure. Okay? But in a normal person, it's somewhere between maybe 25 and 35% of your physical activity. Okay? That's going to encompass what we would call leisure time activity. So this is, I don't know, you're expending energy playing Fortnite or something. Okay? Or, you know, you're standing up walking around down at Campus Corner or you want some place to go shopping, whatever that might be. Leisure time physical activity. It might be work, okay? Any of you that have a job that requires you to do anything, okay? Not just sit behind the desk. Maybe you're a waiter or a waitress. Maybe you are like the guys in my neighborhood that drive the Amazon trucks and like sprint the packages up to your up to your door and back because they're on clock because Jeff Bezos is the worst person in the world. But there may be things that you expend during work. It may be what we would term as planned exercise. Okay, those are all going to fall in this particular pot. Okay, and then what we would call non meat non exercise activity thermogenesis. So. If it's hot outside and you go out, right, because it's, you know, August in Oklahoma and it's hot, in order to dissipate some of that heat, it's going to require, it's going to raise your core body temperature and that requires you. Okay. So, for a lot of people, this portion of the pie is going to be the one that they have the most control over your ability to kind of increase this and increase your daily energy expenditure. If we do some things like resistance training and we increase the amount of muscle we have in our body, we may be able to increase our basal or resting metabolic rate some. But this piece of the pie, the activity portion, this is the place where we're going to get most of our, our wiggle room in how active we are. Okay? So, if we look at this, how many calories can we burn in 30 minutes of doing certain things, okay? Watching TV in a half an hour, well, here we have uh, the red is if you weigh like 150 pounds, the blue is if you weigh 200 pounds. But like just sitting there watching TV, if you're a 200 pound person, you may burn about 50 calories. That's basically like resting metabolic rate, okay? Over the course of that particular time. Whereas if you were playing tennis, and does anybody play tennis anymore or something, okay? You play tennis, you might burn up to 350 calories. Okay? If you're outside gardening, anybody ever, ever had to pull weeds? Yeah? It's a pretty, pretty brisk kind of activity. Um, it's going to, you might burn up to like 215 calories. Okay? So basketball there, jogging, like up to maybe 450, golfing if you're walking in the golf and not riding in the golf cart. As you all will note, basically kissing is not much increase over kind of regular resting kind of activities that's going to be there. All right, but depending upon what it is that you're doing, you may have this increase in caloric expenditure above and beyond what you might get from watching TV and just kind of sitting. Okay. So that's going to tell us some things. We need, okay, to provide certain health and certain fitness benefits we need to expend a certain average amount of calories per day above and beyond what our resting metabolic rate is going to be. Okay. And so those recommendations are here. What you're going to see is this is a recommendation for time. How long should you do certain activities? And if you pick an activity and you look at the time, we can go back to the caloric expenditure for that particular activity and figure out like how many excess calories we need to burn. And that's how we derive.
Okay? I will promise you, what you see in front of you right now will be on the first test. It will be on the final. It will be on your exit exam that you take in Capstone when you're graduating. If I see you after you graduate, I will ask you if you still remember this. Okay? If you learn and remember nothing else from class but this, and that if you're active and you do this, even if you're obese, you're better off, and I will have considered class to be a success. Okay? The major health benefits of physical activity can be gained by performing 150 minutes per week of what we call moderate intensity physical activity. 150 minutes per week. Okay. That's walking is moderate intensity activity. Walking is moderate intensity activity. Okay. So we got 150. Let me find walking on here. Okay, walking the dog, a little less if you're walking my dogs because whatever, but you're burning about 200 calories, okay? It's going to be there. You multiply those 200 calories by your, right, that would be, it's in a half an hour, multiply those 200 calories by uh, about five, you're burning about 1,000 calories from the whole. Modern intensity activity. So you need to walk about 22 minutes per day. That's where those numbers come in. 22 minutes per day, every day. How many of you think you walk that much? How many of you walk 20 minutes a day? Okay. Cool. How many of you think your parents walk 22 minutes a day? Some of you? Okay. How many think your grandparents, if you're still alive, your grandparents walk 22 minutes a day? Conversely, what if I don't walk, Dr. Black? What if I run? Okay. We know if I run, that burns more calories in the same time frame than walking. So if I need to burn a thousand calories or get a thousand calories of physical activity in a week. I can run. I can do what we call vigorous intensity aerobic activity. This is jogging, okay? If I jog, I only need 75 minutes per week, okay? If we make the assumption that jogging costs about twice as many calories as walking does, right? Per unit of time. So I need 75 minutes per week of jogging. That works out to, what is it, like 12 minutes a day of jogging. How many of you get 75 minutes of jogging? Anybody? Okay. Three of y'all, okay? I struggle with that, I do. I walk the dogs that much, and I walk my daughter, we walk around the block some, we don't go very fast. My lovely basset hounds that I love dearly, their idea of a walk is this way, no, stop, turn around, this way, stop. I smelled something back over here. It's kind of crazy. Okay? So, or some combination of the two of these. In a general sense, what you need to get is you need, a, you need to burn about 1,000 calories in physical activity per week to get the health benefits of that activity. Okay? So, park farther away. Walk. Right? You guys think you're not getting it here? Park down at William. Walk your ass up here. Okay. I forgot my park. I didn't order my faculty parking pass early enough, and I had to park down and basically all the way down there and walk up like last week every day. I hated every minute of it, but I had to walk back and forth like twice a day. I got plenty of activity by doing all of that. Okay. So 150 minutes of moderate, or 75 minutes of vigorous, or some kind of combination of these. Additionally, to meet the recommendations, you need two days of whole body strength training, whole body resistance training, okay? Working the arms, working your legs, working your back, okay? Two days a week, somewhere between maybe eight to 10 strength exercises in this eight to 12 rep range 
typically if you're going to where you cannot do an in route. Those are the recommendations. If you want to glean the most health benefit, the largest health benefit, that's what we do. Okay? That's what we do. I will ask you this. What are the current guidelines? What are the current ACSM recommendations for physical activity on your test? Please give me this. Okay? Question. Some kind of interesting ways to, to get around on that all of this. So you guys would probably not be that surprised if I told you that somewhere between maybe 40 to 60 percent, depending upon how we survey them, 40 to 60 percent of American adults do not meet those guidelines. Okay? Do not. If we relax them a little bit to take out the resistance train, our numbers go up a little bit. Okay. But you guys walk to class, sit in class, get up, walk to your next class, okay? How should we count all of that in comparison to say a person that just goes out to go for a walk and they walk for 20 minutes and then shop? We know that if you accumulate your activity in these intermittent bouts, that these fitness and health benefits seem to be similar, whether you do them all at once or if you do them in little Kind of in little bursts, okay? So walk 10 minutes now, walk 10 minutes in an hour, walk 10 minutes this evening, you've got 30 total minutes of, of walking today. That's the same as if you're gonna get the same benefits as if you walk 30 minutes straight, okay? As long as your speed is the same, you're gonna be good, okay? We've tried to use that as a way to tell people and encourage people to get out and be more active. Look, man, you got 10 minutes now, right? If it's lunchtime, go get up and walk for 10 minutes. And then tonight when you get home, you can find 10 minutes tonight to walk, right? Get up 10 minutes early in the morning for everyone that's not my wife. And, um, you know, if you make that suggestion to her, you're going to get punched, right? She loves her sleep. You can do 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at lunch and 10 minutes at night and voila, you got your 30 in the course of the day. It makes it seem like it's easier to achieve. We've tried all of that. It still doesn't work. People still don't want to do it. Okay? But it will work. It will work. Okay. So I'm going to introduce something here. Okay? And it's going to be confusing to you guys because we haven't actually talked about the underlying physiology of any of this yet. I'm going to mention a couple of terms, and then we're going to leave them alone for a couple of weeks, and we're going to come back to them a little bit later on. Okay? So I know that this is going to lack some of the kind of necessary background, but I want to go ahead and at least introduce the terminology. So you guys remember that I said, how do we define the intensity of physical activity, or how do we define the intensity of exercise. Intensity is determined by the energy expenditure. Okay. Walking, I'm walking. Walking is moderate intensity. I'm pretty light, so if I'm walking pretty fast, I'm walking or I'm marching here. Moderate intensity. And if I start jogging, that's more vigorous. And if I really go fast, okay, it requires more energy as a going to higher and higher okay? The way that we try to quantify that or talk about that when we, we get into exercise things is we very often, we prescribe or we look at an intensity relative to some maximal rate of expending energy, okay? We need to normalize it across because all of you have different amounts of muscle, all of you have different levels of physical fitness, okay? So the maximal capacity of all of you to expend energy is going to be a little bit different among everyone. And so we need a way to kind of make some recommendations that will fit for everyone regardless of kind of what they're talking about. So what we do then is we prescribe intensity based upon some percentage of what we would call VO2 max, okay, or heart rate max, or what's called VO2 reserve, or heart rate reserve, or 
with a thing called a metabolic equivalent. Okay? VO2 max. Anybody heard the term VO2 max before? Sarah, you have? What class did you have where you talked about VO2 max? Ooh, on your Apple Watch app. Okay. Ooh, it was really bad? No, it was like a... Oh, that's about it. Okay, I got you. Got you. Perfect. So, VO2 max is the single best measure of what we will call cardiorespiratory fitness. Okay? So, this is our gold standard for who has good endurance. It is a measure that requires good cardiovascular function, good pulmonary function. It requires lots of mitochondria in your muscles. VO2 max is, in essence, the highest rate at which your body can make ATP from oxygen and a glucose or lipid-derived substance. That's VO2 max. To find your VO2 max, we put you on the treadmill, we have you run, or you can start off walking, and we increase the speed and the grade, and we just have you run until you can't go anymore. And we collect all of the air that you're breathing out during that time, and we get a number at the very end. Okay? So, this is the best thing, and so we would say walking occurs at some percentage. It's an energy expenditure that is some percentage of your maximal ability to generate energy, okay? Walking may occur at 40% of VO2 max, 50% of VO2 max. Jogging may be at 60 or 65% of VO2 max, okay? Running very, as fast as you can, but not sprinting, may be at 80 or 85% of VO2 max. That's how we would define it, okay? VO2 reserves, don't worry about, that's a complicated issue. Your watches, and my guess as to what Sarah's Apple Watch is trying to do is you enter your age and it knows what your age predicted maximal heart rate should be. And then you go and you run at some speed or you do something and it measures what your heart rate is and it plugs that into some algorithms and it's trying to guesstimate based upon what your heart rate was at a particular work rate what your VO2 max should be. There's these kind of known relationships so, we can prescribe, as your energy expenditure goes up, your heart rate naturally goes up as well. Your heart has to circulate more blood so that it can supply more oxygen things so that you can make more energy. So, everybody has this age-predicted maximum heart rate. And we may tell you to go exercise. Walking is going to elicit a heart rate response that is some percentage of your max heart rate. Jogging elicits some percentage of max heart rate higher than walking, but kind of not there, okay? There is a very good linear relationship between percentage of heart rate max and what we call heart rate reserve, which we'll talk about later in class, and your percentage of VO2 max. We can use heart rate as a surrogate for your energy expenditure. So if you have an Apple Watch, you have a Fitbit, or something that measures your heart rate, as your heart rate is going up, your energy expenditure is going up, okay? It's very simple. So we could prescribe intensity based upon telling you you need to go jog fast enough that you're going to get 150 beats per minute of heart rate. Okay? A MET is a strange phenomenon, and the epidemiologists use METs, the physiologists don't use them very much. Okay? A MET is something called a metabolic equivalent. A MET attempts to kind of look at energy expenditure as it relates to not top end, but bottom end, okay? One metabolic equivalent is your resting metabolic rate. You guys are all sitting here right now, right? You're consuming oxygen, you're generating carbon dioxide, you're making some amount of ATP. Your resting metabolic rate is one metabolic equivalent. We would then say, go walk. Okay, how, and then we would say, how far over your baseline rate is walking? Walking is like three METs. So it's an energy expenditure that's three times your resting rate. 
jogging might be eight minutes. It might be eight times your resting weight. Okay? And so, again, we can convert this back into a percentage of VO2 max gnosis, but that's what a metabolic equivalent is. You may see things that will say moderate intensity activity is something that is going to have an energy expenditure of three to six metabolic equivalents. Vigorous intensity activity is going to be at greater than six metabolic equivalents. So that's kind of what you can look at. Does that make sense? Some knobs of tanks, yes, no, maybe. I know we're, you know, research tells us after 40 minutes you guys are going to tune me out anyway. Um, so I know we're kind of getting out there, kind of reaching the, the edge of, of what we can unfold. So here's some metabolic equivalent stuff. Okay, so current understanding, boom, boom, boom. All right, so I like this, okay? What we're going to see throughout class, and we're going to try to explore some of the hows and the whys of this, is if you want to be healthier, you need to be more fit. If you want to be more fit, you need to exercise more, you need to be more active. Okay? We can make an argument that for a lot of chronic conditions, the single best and most efficient and cheapest medicine is exercise. Okay? Exercise. You want to lower your blood pressure? Exercise. You want to prevent a heart attack? Exercise. You want to not have a stroke? Exercise. You want to treat your type 2 diabetes? Exercise. Okay. You want to have better pulmonary function? Don't smoke, then exercise. Okay. One of the things that we know is that being sedentary, okay, not meeting the physical activity guidelines, so being sedentary, not getting enough activity or exercise, is considered the number two preventable cause of death in the U.S. Number two. You guys want to guess what number one is? What's the leading preventable cause of death in the U.S.? Smoking, right? How much time in your life have, has been spent with people telling you don't freaking smoke? How many commercials have you seen? How many ads and magazines and things have you seen that say, don't smoke, it's bad for you, right? You guys seen a bunch of that? How often do you get the thing about being active though? How often do you see commercials on TV that say, hey, go out and go for a walk today. It'll save your life. Hey, go, go for a run. Go walk your dog. I don't know. Go like paddle a boat or get in a canoe or whatever. Okay? We don't make a push on those kinds of things. How many of you, when you, do you remember, can remember when you were in elementary school? Okay. Sarah remembers. Nobody else remembers. Y'all block that out, right? That's what I did for my junior high and some of my high school years. It was very traumatic. I blocked all of it out. Try to think about when you were in elementary school. Okay. How many days per week did you have PE? Two. Okay. Two. You know how many days I had PE when I was in elementary school? For a while it was five, yeah. And then we got cut down to three when we got a little older because we had to work in music class, God forbid them, um, and all of that. The music would have been more of more benefit, of more benefit to me. It takes way more skill to be um, to be a talented musician and those kinds of things. Okay. We are taking physical activity out of our lives. We're taking it out of school. We're taking it out of work. Okay? We're making everything better. Silicon Valley wants us to have an app for everything, right? whether we need it or not. But we are removing physical activity from our lives. There's evidence that children that are more active will become adults that are more active. Okay? There's not very many little kids that play in my neighborhood in Oklahoma City. I don't see kids riding their bikes around very much. 
may be reasons for that. But I remember when I was little, when I was in elementary school, every day, home from school, get on my bike, right? We'd go ride around on our bikes and then go off and play, like run around in the woods. Maybe we shouldn't have, but that's what we did. Mom was like, get out of the house, go run around and go do things. You don't see that anymore, right? Kids have iPads, they have phones, they have computers, they're playing Fortnite, they're playing, I don't know, whatever else. Mine's watching Teletubbies or something, right? We are not as active as we used to be, and it is killing us, right? It is killing us. And it costs us money. Other people not being active cost me money. It will cost you all money when you have to pay for your own health insurance, right? Because of a bunch of these other Seventy percent of Americans don't meet the physical activity recommendations. Thirty percent of adults get zero, zero leisure time physical activity. These numbers tend to be a little bit higher in women, especially in older women. Y'all's generation is better. Ladies, y'all are kicking the guys' asses now. We have better data. Okay. So did you all know they wouldn't let women run the marathon, like run marathons until the like the late 1970s because they were afraid your uterus was going to fall out? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Like, they legitimately thought like it was a health hazard because, you know, having kids is the single only thing that women are on this planet for, right? Um, until then. We've now decided, oh, look, strength training. Also probably a pretty good thing for women to do. It's pretty good for everybody. So... We're going to have all of this, okay? So big, big issues. Here are county-level estimates of people not meeting the physical activity guidelines. Dark blue are the higher number of people that do not meet physical activity guidelines, okay? So let's look at this. Here, here, up through Appalachia, right? Does this graph remind you of something from Monday? What does it remind you of? Death and obesity. I think that shows you the death one, the mortality rate one, and the obesity rate one. Well, look, the physical activity one looks very, very much like that. We are, like, right here, I believe this is Cleveland County. Okay? Here's Oklahoma. I think Edmond is actually up here. So if you look at all the states, you can find where the kids are. You can find where the universities are by looking at the counties. Here in Arkansas, the University of Arkansas is right there. That's in Washington County, okay? You can come all the way down here in Baton Rouge in Louisiana, right? It's going to be there. Mississippi doesn't work quite so well. Oxford is right about here, okay? So it's Lafayette County, but they call it Lafayette because Mississippi. Um, there's Lafayette County, Mississippi State is here. Tuscaloosa is there, and Tuscaloosa and Birmingham are going to be right there. So you can kind of figure out where things are going to be based upon all of that, okay? We are not great from an activity standpoint as a state. And we are a relatively rural state where there is still farming and working in the oil fields and those kinds of things. So you can kind of imagine what that tells us about everything. Okay, inactivity is a risk factor. So not meeting the guidelines is a risk factor, okay? So, here we have leading risk factors for global mortality rate in 04. Here was physical inactivity, right? Tobacco use was going to be up here. We can't do much about high blood pressure and high blood glucose. So these two things are stuff that we actually have some level of behavioral control over. Okay? Just some ways to kind of drive this home again on what we know about things. Being physically inactive is a bigger risk to your health than having unprotected sex. You guys have probably been yelled at about don't have unprotected sex. It's a bigger risk factor than excessive alcohol use, okay? It's a bigger risk factor than childhood sort of underweight, okay? In, in those kinds of ways. And there's some really, really bad things going on in the kids that are now there. Okay? This is a big deal. This is a big deal. And people know it, they still Okay, the ups risk for these things, we've talked about this. I'll do a little bit of cost, and then we'll get out of here, guys. And these data are about 10 years old. 
the cost of people being act inactive from a healthcare standpoint is about $150 billion every year. Billion with a B. Okay? If we could convince everyone to go walk 20 minutes a day, we'd save $150 billion. A person that is not active compared to a person that is on average spends almost $1,500 a year more in healthcare costs. I don't know about you guys, but I can think of a lot of things that we can do with $1,500 right, rather than spend it at night. But all I have to do is get up and go for a walk for 20 minutes. Okay, right? It's a pretty nice spring break trip with $1,500, right? Do that for a couple of years, you got a nice down payment on a car or whatever it is. It doesn't even matter, whatever it is. Or I've got, I can buy lots of purses and shoes with that, right? It's the only thing that she buys. She doesn't care about clothes, but she likes purses and shoes. So, anyway, that's going to be what we have there. Why is being inactive so bad? You know what? We're going to stop there. We'll pick up with this on next week. All right, here's what I want you to do for me. For next week, here is what your assignment is for Monday. Okay? I want you to make a list from tomorrow through Sunday. I want you to keep a journal or a log, and I want you to write down all physical activity that you do over those four days. Okay? I want you to try to write down what you think is a rough intensity and what you think the time for all of those things. So whatever it is that you think is physical activity, okay? Not just exercise. But physical activity. All right, we will bring those on Monday and we'll kind of look at them and we'll talk about them. And then we'll move on. All right, good deal. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Make good choices. That's all I'm going to say.